anybody can be taught anything. I think it comes down to what you're interested in. Welcome back to Inside Outside Innovation, episode 103. I'm the producer, Victory Clafter. Andy Plantenberg is an innovation consultant with about as much experience as one can have in such a new market. Her history includes large organizations, small startups, and starting her own business, all on the path toward working now to expand entrepreneurial capabilities in teams. Her conversation with Brian addressed, among many things, how teachable is innovation, and what's the most effective incentive? Reach out to her on Twitter at AndySF. That's A-N-D-I-S-F. Big thank you to all our attendees last week at the Inside Outside Innovation Summit who made it a wild success. We're excited to keep learning and growing with all of you in this ever-changing world. I'm a bit of a dinosaur, at least it really feels that way in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco where the medium age is a bit younger than everywhere else in the country. But I've been working in and around Silicon Valley since the early mid-90s and in internet-related things since 1995 where I was a web designer for AOL. And at that time, there was really just a handful of us in the world. And then now it's a very different story. But I have been um, embedded with large companies and it's and part of startup teams and uh, have been an entrepreneur myself. In addition to working with many different startups over the many years since the dot-com bubble, I founded and ran a digital product and design studio called Single Bound Creative that had an 11-year run in San Francisco. And that is where I just learned so much about making digital products, and I learned a lot about how to run and grow a business. In the past several years, I've really been focused on innovation and growing and building entrepreneurial capabilities in teams, and that is what I focused on with my consultancy. Well, and I think that's one of the interesting things. You, you know, back in the mid-90s, I was in the, the same space, you know, building out products and services. I was back in Asia, you know, with the first usability lab out there that was kind of dedicated to how do you uh, kind of create the, the internet out there? And so, you know, back in those days, it cost, you know, $2 million to spin up a website. And uh, that capability is now in the hands of everybody. So in addition to that kind of change, what are some of the kind of core things that you've seen over the years that have really changed the way people create and build and introduce value into the market? You know, this is such an interesting topic for me and something I spend a lot of time thinking about because really, in the past 20 years, things have changed so much. And we don't really, it's hard to see it, I guess is what I'd say. It's hard to see it when you're standing in the middle of it. And I'm trying to think of an analogy, and I hope I do. And if I do, I'll share it with you, but I haven't yet. But to, just to like paint a picture of, of the type of change we've seen and how fast it is, imagine some kind of huge thing that changed how we live, something like electricity, right? If you think back to when your grandparents were children, it was a very, very different world two generations ago. Um, most people were reading by candlelight. We would refrigerate our food by putting it low to the ground or in an ice box where we actually had a giant block of ice in there. That ice being shipped to us on a train from a cold climate where they dug it out of a lake. So that was two, two generations ago. And it took 70 years for electricity to roll out to the whole country uh, after the light bulb was invented. So put that in your mind and then think what it was like just in 1995. That is when most, like half of us never touched a computer at work. And there were 10% of Americans who were called early adopters who may have had a computer room at home and who logged on, I'm using air quotes over here, you can't see it, but logged on to the internet for sometimes up to 30 minutes a session. That's what it was like in 1995. Compare that 10% of early adopters who sometimes looked at the internet to the 75% of people who just 10 years later were walking around with interconnected supercomputers in their pockets. I mean, it's just kind of like, it's kind of hard to get your head around, yet we've all lived through it. 
There's never been anything like that. And it has been, I mean, very, it's speeding up. I mean, if you think about, just name the half dozen uh, new technologies that you're hearing about, whether it's blockchain or AI or machine learning, or again, there's probably a half dozen that uh, kind of pop into most people's heads. It's one thing, any one of those particular technologies, and I've said this before, could disrupt an industry, disrupt your workforce, et cetera, but they're all hitting at the same time. And so if you thought the speed yep. of change was fast before, just think what's going to be in the, in the next 10 years. So it's yeah, quite interesting, fascinating times to, to be living this uh, culture right now, which really points to where you're in the business of helping companies kind of navigate this. So let's talk a little bit about how, how do you do that? How do you help a company kind of understand the precipice that they're standing on and then how to navigate the newness that's going to be uh, impacting their Well, industry. the thing that, that makes that a, a little bit easier is that now I'm seeing across industries, uh, people in the C-suite poking their heads up and trying to figure out like what they need to do because they're seeing their growth curves flattening out because they're fearing this disruption. And I think some, you hear a lot about digitization. Um, we need to digitize um, the world's digital now. Software is eating the world, et cetera. But really, I think the underpinning of that, and this is where the conversation starts, is that it's really not a, simply about digitizing and learning software. It is really about how to grow a culture that can deal with this change. Because what this change brings about is a lack of certainty and a fundamental unpredictability that just didn't exist before. So all these organizations are really optimized for delivering at scale a well-understood solution to a well-understood market. And both of those well-understood components are, are going away. So while the core business is being maintained as this kind of curve goes down, there needs to be a machine for learning and adaptation that is that needs to stand up alongside of that and that's where my conversations take me and that's the the work that i've been doing for um, the past several years now is around how exactly to do that well you really nailed it i mean the, the fact is that companies now have to do both they, you know they have to maintain and build their their scalable existing optimized business model but yet they really do have to create something new or have the capabilities to do that. And, and it's so hard from what I've seen in the marketplace is because they, they've never built for that, uh, you know, except, you know, maybe the early days when they were actually building their first company. Uh, and you see very few companies that kind right. of have that ethos and continue that ethos. You know, Amazon's one example, obviously, but it's, you know, a core founder that built the business and continues to build the business. But once you kind of get that first, second generation <laughs> past that startup phase, it's really difficult to, to reinvent yourself. Yeah. It is difficult. And that's one of the tricky things about this is that doing this is absolutely not easy or straightforward. Right. It really isn't. And it requires that you touch every level of the org and it's very daunting. So I do find myself being a bit of a psychologist at times <laughs> to people within larger organizations who are trying to do this work because it is really important to get started. And the good thing about us having us, you know, the collective us trying to do this type of thing since the Lean Startup came out, there have been lots of trials and lots of errors and therefore lots and lots of learning. So we do have some examples that we can go by. We do have, it's not a clear cut playbook, but there are things that have been working that you can adapt to your own organization in order to do this. What are some of the kind of the top either pitfalls that you're seeing that companies are avoiding or, or things that they're putting in place that make it easier uh, if, if that's capable, if that's actually a possibility. Well, I, I am excited to um, talk at the, at the summit. Uh, there are three anti-patterns that I've summed up that I want to just kind of simplify and get out there so people can just kind of short, take a shortcut around that and not replay those mistakes. And then there are some, um, some good starting points of what you can do today. One big pattern we see is the aqua hire. The aqua hire. Yep. And um, this isn't where you acquire a startup for a line of business, but where you acquire a startup primarily for their DNA, for their ability to do what they do, and cool. to hope that that mojo spreads around your organization. Yeah, you almost have to hire those entrepreneurs and residents, so to speak, because there's a different type of person typically than the person who's, you know, again, an optimizer for an existing business model. 
Right. And it really is a different kind of person and a different kind of culture. But what we see in the aqua hire and why that fails is that once you take the DNA of that team and spread it throughout your organization that is siloed and that is optimized for delivery at scale, you dismantle the core structure that creates the learning machine. Um, That startup team structure is optimized for learning and optimizing for adapting to that learning. And once you dismantle that and mush it into the parent org, it it kind of dies. And, And the pattern that we see is that the senior staff leave as soon as they vest, and then it's just kind of business as usual. Right. You've talked, a, I mean, a lot about this concept of learning and adaptation, and I think that's, you know, obviously those, those are the two core skills that anybody in the workforce moving forward in this, you know, era of endless innovation is going to have to, to deal with. Can it be taught? Can can you teach kind of the the traditional uh, cubicle person who's who's been optimizing and doing a really, really great job at delivery? Can you teach them to be more adaptable and, and progressive and some of these new skills? I think absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Anybody can be taught anything. I think it comes down to what you're interested in. I believe that if you are really all about delivering very well at a certain thing, then you should deliver very well at that thing. But if you are one of the people who has the entrepreneurial spark or one of those people who wonders if their time and efforts day after day is creating real value in the world, then you are well suited to doing this sort of work. It's hard. It requires the hunger to learn about a thing and not to hone your craft. You are fundamentally learning about whether or not a certain product or business venture is viable and you're articulating assumptions and upending them all the time. Um, So you have to enjoy that sort of thing. But if you have that spark and are interested, then absolutely there's no reason why, you know, anybody can't learn it. So talk to me a little bit, maybe some examples or or some of the companies you might have been working with that uh, you've seen this either go really bad or or really great. Uh, Maybe some some real life case studies of of some things you've seen. Yeah, so uh, the, the way this typically starts when I'm involved is that we set up a startup team that's small and it ha- it's, cr- it's multidiscipline. It's important to note that multidiscipline doesn't just mean a balanced product team with a designer, a PM, and a developer, but it means actually like a small company. Like if there needs to be someone from finance or compliance or legal in there, that they're there on the startup team. And we get some executive air cover because we're going to need to do things by exception and we need someone to kind of clear the path for us. But in those teams, you will see who is interested in the work and who ends up pulling away because they really don't like it. <laughs> and I think it's important to honor that and not try to try to force people into it. What are some of the signs that you can pick out? when that's happening? Um, so I think that often, especially in large organizations where they're up, and organizations that are very risk averse, um, like some of the lending or some of the financial organizations I've worked with, mm-hmm. uh, there is a reflex to um, fall back on processes uh, that are there for our safety and protection, whether that be compliance or whether it be design processes that mm-hmm. keep us out of uh, risky territory in terms of how we are perceived by our peers, like dotting all our I's and and crossing all our T's. Systems are resilient by nature. And when we're embedded in a culture that is fooled for delivering well at scale, there's a very human and social component to that. When I'm working with teams and I witness certain individuals really reluctant to step away from that when given the opportunity, um, that that is a signal to me that that person may not be comfortable with doing this type of work. Other people um, might be just like very excited at the opportunity and um, cautiously but purposely want to step right through that doorway. 
And so that's what you see uh, on the ground in the very early days when you're standing up these teams. I think it's an important point. And, and you know, I, I, some of the things I think that kind of influence that sometimes are, are like incentive systems, you know, so how, how are teams incentivized to kind of take those risks when every kind of uh, signal they get from the corporation is don't <laughs> take those risks. Uh, so like, how do you create that, like you said, that kind of boundary or, or air cover uh, to give them that, that freedom to to learn and do things differently than in the past? Yeah, as far as incentives, that's still a very open conversation. Yeah. Uh, what I've been seeing is if you pick the people who are excited about doing that work and simply protect them from being fired, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of funny. But the purpose of standing up this first startup team is really to see where it breaks down when it tries to do the work in the larger org. And you want to see that breakdown, you want to see where it's hard so you can fix those things. So a very important part of it is to see what you need to fix and to discover that by, by starting to do the work. That's the end of another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. Thanks for listening. If you want to continue the conversation, reach out to us on Twitter at the IO Podcast or join our community at insideoutside.io. Until next time, go out and innovate.